you can't do the housework. You don't even have a job. How long are you going to stay here? About two months after my husband passed away, I was secretly looking through an album filled with memories of him, and my mother-in-law said to me hatefully, "Besides, you are a stranger, not one of our family members, and you're crying like this to show off. Do you think you are the victim?" No, that's not what I meant. I lost my precious son, and all I am left with is my failed and brazen daughter-in-law. I'm the one who wants to cry, not you. When my husband was alive, and even after he passed away, I worked my butt off to provide for James and my mother-in-law. I worked and worked. I did all the housework to meet my mother-in-law's needs. And now I am being treated like a stranger. You were just a caretaker, and you're no longer needed. So, get the hell out of my house. Okay. I want you to pack your bags by the end of the day. I've got no wife to bother me, and now the house and the car are mine. My mother-in-law smiled happily. I had noticed something, but I didn't tell my mother-in-law. I have been used and abused so much in the past. Let her go through a little bit of hell. I can't wait to see the look on my mother-in-law's face when she finds out. The whole story starts a decade ago. I married my husband James, and now we live with him and my mother-in-law. James's father passed away when James was in high school, and when we were dating, James lived at home with his mother. He was going to move out of his parents' house when he got married, and started living with me. But his mother didn't want that, because she was lonely and she strongly wanted him to live with her. So we ended up moving in all together when we got married. We had saved money together before we got married, and we built a house at the same time we got married. So my mother-in-law was going to live there with us. James and I both wanted to have children. But eight years ago, James got in a car accident that left him paralyzed and in need of care. It became difficult for us to have children, and James even suggested that we divorce because I was taking care of him. But I didn't want to divorce him, so I persistently persuaded him that I would take care of him, and we decided to stay married. Housework, job, and taking care of James. I resigned from my job and began writing from home because it had become difficult for me to work outside the home. As a student, I had been writing columns and blogs on the internet part time, and the company I worked for was also in the publishing field, so I was occasionally asked to write small articles. It was an incredibly busy time, but I was happy to be able to spend a lot of time with James. Who had been so busy with his work that we barely had time to spend together. James took care of me, and even when I was getting used to taking care of him, he would never forget to thank me. I think we had a fulfilling and happy marriage, except for one thing: my mother-in-law. Before James's car accident, my mother-in-law was a quiet person who didn't talk much. She spoke kindly to me. And although she didn't seem to be very good at housework, I got the impression that she was a classy woman who enjoyed the gardening and watching the theater. She thinks it's a woman's job to do the housework perfectly. When I served him prepared food for dinner on days when I came home tired from work, she would say, "I can't believe you put this kind of food on the table." On my days off, when James did the laundry for me. She said she can't believe that I let him do the housework, but that was a few times. I didn't mind because she just laughed then and said that things were different now compared to the past, and that she was sorry. But after James got in a car accident, she took advantage of the fact that he didn't see me and started to go against me more and more. She used to take care of herself. Now she puts all the housework on me. 
saying it's just added work and that she doesn't think it will make a difference with one more person to take care of. She never used to say anything about buying food for her or James, but now she checks what I buy without her permission and blames me for wasting money if there is even a small amount of sweets. No matter how much I loved James and how fulfilled he made me feel every day, to be honest, I was physically and mentally exhausted. My mother-in-law's sarcasm hit hard on me. On top of that, my mother-in-law didn't understand the work of a work-at-home writer. So, when I was working in my room or living room, she thought I was playing on a computer and she would sarcastically criticize me. She also asked me to go buy fruits at the supermarket even when I'm working. To tell the truth, I was getting tired of living with my mother-in-law. But I didn't want to worry James because James thought that she and I were getting along well. She was a nice and calm person with some sharp words. But she never yelled at me or threw things. So I decided to ignore her and let her get on with her life. After living like this for quite a long time, when I got used to caring for James and living with my mother-in-law, suddenly, James collapsed and passed away. It was a subarachnoid hemorrhage. I was unprepared for the suddenness of it all, and I couldn't even say goodbye to him. There were so many things I had to do. I had asked my supervisor of the writer's job, and I had been given extended deadlines. Our house is a mess because of all the housework I haven't done. But I don't feel like doing anything. No matter what I did, it didn't feel real, and I felt as if I was detached from myself. I don't feel alive, yet I get hungry and sleepy every day. My body is trying to live while my mind was abundant living. It was strange. I didn't care about anything. But only thing that kept me sane through it all was my concern for my mother-in-law. After James passed away, my mother-in-law became a different person. She started raising her voice at the slightest thing. Once, when the housework was out of control, I didn't notice a little dust on the TV. My mother-in-law saw that. Why can't you even do this level of the housework? There's still dust here. Can't you see it? She exclaimed hysterically. My mother-in-law, who had never raised her voice, no matter how sarcastic she was, now cried out devilishly. I'm sorry. I'll clean up right away. Please, come down. Who the hell do you think you are? I'm calm. Get on with the cleaning. I'm sorry, I'll do it right now. I can't believe she can't even do this. What a lousy wife he got. I tried to soothe her, but her mood kept getting worse. And once she raised her voice, she was out of control. She had lost her husband early and her precious only son. So no wonder. It would be dangerous to leave my mother-in-law alone in this condition and I would feel bad for James, who was worried about her. I decided to live together with my mother-in-law. When I made this decision, strangely enough, I suddenly felt the energy to live. The day had been like walking on a cloud. I was like a lost child. But suddenly, everything became a reality for me. I was working faster and more efficiently than ever before and I cleaned up every single mess in my house. I prepared healthier meals than I had when James was here and tried to include as many of my mother-in-law's favorite side dishes as possible. Whenever I had some free time at work, I even invited my mother-in-law to go to the theater with me, hoping that she would feel a little refreshed. However, my mother-in-law's hysterics did not stop. In fact, they seemed to intensify day by day. I told myself every day that it wasn't hard, and I tried my best to live with my mother-in-law while thinking about James. But one day, 
everything suddenly became hard, as if a thread had been cut. Suddenly, I wanted to see James. I opened an album of photos of James, as if I was being drawn to it. I was so taken aback by the many smiling faces of James in the album, but I couldn't help but gasp. James was looking at me with my favorite smile. From the time we met to after we were married, I reached out for James, but all I felt was cold. I can no longer hear his voice. I can no longer touch him. I felt like I was being reminded of something so obvious. I couldn't help but shed a tear or two. Once they flowed, they flowed one after another like a dam. I cried aloud like a child. I have never cried with such emotion since James left. I could feel that someone was there, so I turned around and saw my mother in law, who was supposed to be out of the house, quietly staring at me. I hurriedly wiped away my tears. Welcome home. I'm sorry. I'll get the dinner ready right away. With that, I put the album away and hurriedly got up. I'm sure my eyes are bloodshot and swollen, so I'm sure she knows I've been crying. I'm about to walk past my mother-in-law though, when she stops me and says, "Lily, why are you crying?" "Yes, I'm sorry I showed you my embarrassment." My mother-in-law stared at me with emotionless eyes. I was hoping that my mother-in-law might say something comforting or encouraging at the moment. No matter how sarcastic she might normally be, we were both people who had lost loved ones. I thought we shared the same pain, but what my mother-in-law said to me was something I never expected. You are not a family member, but you are playing a victim. You're such a nasty woman. You are a stranger, no family. I'm sure you are not sad that James is gone. You went to all this trouble to make a show of it, and you cried like a liar. No, I was not acting. I'm sad about James too. You're full of lies. I'm tired of living with you. You are just a caretaker. How long do you think you are going to stay here? Get your stuff and get out of here. I was too shocked to say anything to my mother-in-law. I thought I had been supporting my mother-in-law for a long time, even though my heart was worn out. I knew she was probably grieving more than I was, so I didn't expect her to be grateful to me. I felt like by supporting and comforting my mother-in-law, she was also comforting me in my suffering. But I had no idea that my mother-in-law thought of me this way. If she had said it to me while she was in the state of hysterics, I might have been able to let it go. But when my mother-in-law said it to me in a calm state, I was at my wit's end. Did my mother-in-law think like that from the bottom of her heart? I decided to leave the house. That night, when I told my mother-in-law that I was leaving the house, she smiled and nodded calmly as before. I felt sorry for my mother-in-law to get her out of the house, who was not working, so I decided to give her the house. I asked her what I should do with the car, which had originally belonged to James's father, and had been given to James to take care of, and she happily told me to leave it all behind. I was worried about whether it would be okay, but my mother-in-law strongly insisted that I leave it behind, so I had no choice. It was hard for me to live with all the memories of James too, because I remembered the happy times when we were together. So I decided to give them all to my mother-in-law. After James passed away, I changed the name of the house and the car to me. But now I changed everything to my mother-in-law's name. My mother-in-law was so happy after everything was done, and she happily said that everything was hers now. Will you be all right? I want to give them back to you, even if you ask me to do so now. It's all mine now. But with the insurance and everything, I've always dreamed of living alone in a house. Oh yes, I should buy new furniture too. 
Let's throw out all this uninspired furniture in this house. My mother-in-law didn't seem to hear a word I said. My mother-in-law was so excited about her new life that I decided to quickly find a new apartment and move in. For the first time in a long time, living alone was calm and comfortable. No one yelled at me out of the blue. No one interfered with my work. I wish I had done this earlier and regretted it a little. A few weeks later, I suddenly received a phone call from my mother-in-law. When I picked up the phone, my mother-in-law screamed at me. Lady, what's going on? What do you mean? Don't play dumb with me. I didn't know it was going to cost this much to pay the taxes on the house. The insurance, the car. I asked you if the insurance and everything will be okay for you. I don't remember. You didn't ask. I don't know how I'm going to pay for this. You pay it instead of me. I'm a pensioner, so I don't have that kind of money. You said that it would be okay and inherited everything. Shut up. And if you are my daughter-in-law, you should at least pay this. We're a family. Oh, you mean I'm a family member? No, no. I'm just a stranger to you. I'm just a caregiver. Beatrice, you told me to leave. I can't take care of someone else than me now. You have to take care of yourself. With that, I hung up the phone without hearing my mother-in-law's reply. After that, she called me again and again, so I blocked her phone number. Then, after a while, my aunt called me. She said that my mother-in-law, who did not know where I was, had contacted all my relatives and was looking for me. My aunt, who was worried about me, contacted me to see if something had happened. I explained to her what had happened, and she just laughed at my mother-in-law and told me about her current situation. She told me that she had sold the house, the car, and everything else because she was having trouble making the payments. However, since my mother-in-law was raised in a wealthy family, had an arranged marriage, and was a naive young lady who had never worked, so did not know the market price of houses and cars, so she sold all of them at a very low price. Now she lives in an old apartment with low rent. She often visits her relatives and says that she hates her old house and blames everything on me. Some of her relatives are having a hard time dealing with her. And recently, some of them have even turned her away instead of letting her in the house when she visits them. At first, some relatives care about my mother-in-law, but she took other people's kindness for granted. So the number of people who cared about her gradually decreased. She has been living a lonely life, refraining from her hobbies, such as gardening and going to the theater. I thanked my aunt for the information, asked her not to talk to my mother-in-law about me, and then quickly hung up the phone. I had just gotten my life back, and I didn't want my mother-in-law to interfere with it again. Although the sadness of not having James has never healed, I am enjoying my new life, surrounded by my writer friends and the friends in the social activity program I recently joined. My name is Sarah. I'm 27 years old and a homemaker. My husband James is three years older than me, 30, and a banker. My parents own a construction company and my parents are still working. James is a graduate of a prestigious university and is just so proud. He talks about my father, who started his own company with a middle school diploma and then makes fun of him. He always looks down on me because of it. James and I met at a party. I was a fashion model for a magazine when I was in college. Because of this, I was often invited to parties, and I liked to attend them. Some celebrities came to these parties too. I met a lot of people, but all of them were just for that short moment. When I was fed up with such routine, I met James. James doesn't drink. He wasn't into it so much so that it was easy to tell that someone from the company had brought him along. 
His lack of fashionable look made him stand out in New York. I was curious about James, so we exchanged contact information. James was a little shaky, perhaps because he was nervous, but I liked it. While keeping in touch with James, I remained the same, enjoying the parties. New York was exciting and very attractive. I even had a part time job where I get paid just by attending parties and drinking together. Looking back, I'm ashamed to have done those things. Then something unexpected happened. At the time, I was in a relationship with my boyfriend. Nevertheless, I was doing what I wanted, and so did he. I really liked him, and still thought we were getting along well. One day, he told me that he was going to get married. This was the first time I found out that he had a fiance. He was not serious about me. I had mistaken his feelings back then. I thought that men pampered me because they liked me. But I was wrong. The only reason they pamper you is that they want to drink in a good mood and feel good. I was not the only one who thought I was doing well to adapt to a city full of lies. I decided to get a serious job after college. But I was already paying the price for my college years of playing around. My grades were not good at all. And I could not get a job at the company I wanted. So I thought about going back to the countryside. But I didn't want to go back to a town with a chorus of frogs leaving the glamorous city. I lied to my parents and said I would stay in New York a little longer because I was about to get a job. My parents were concerned, but it's your life. You are responsible for it. And they let me be free. But once I had enjoyed earning money easily, it was hard for me to lower my standard of living. For a while, I took a part time job. Of course, that's not enough to make a living. I found myself soon resuming attending parties and drinking. It was then that I met James again. That day, I was at the bank job hunting. It was my 10th company this month, and I was about to lose my senses. So I met James again as an interviewer. James didn't seem to notice me there, so I didn't speak to him. But that night, James contacted me and we decided to go out for a drink together. James told me, Unless you stop drinking and go to parties, you will never get a decent, honest job. It may be annoying, but people can tell right away that you have that kind of aura about you. I was shocked when he said that. It was oddly persuasive coming from James, a job interviewer. After that, I started contacting James every day. I realized that I had stopped drinking and attending parties. Then, James confessed to me, and we started dating. I didn't have a steady job, but I was busy working part time. I was job hunting to get a full time job. But James stopped me from doing that. If you marry me, why don't you become a housewife? You don't have to worry about money. I would be happy if you did the house chores. Why don't you take a cooking class? I thought I was a total winner and felt like everything was going so well. I mistakenly thought that I could win even if I didn't have a job thanks to my looks after all. I was completely on a roll at the time. As James said, I went to cooking classes and improved myself. Then James told me I was cute and cherished me every day. My friends around me were envious of me, and I felt like I had somehow won for life. Then he proposed to me, which I had been waiting for, and we soon moved in together. James had a pretty good rent allowance from his company, so we lived in a beautiful apartment. I started living there too, and every day was sparkling. When I told my family about it, they were very happy, and I was glad I didn't have to go back to the countryside back then. Then, we greeted both our families to get married. 
coming to my hometown, James, who grew up in the city, just laughed. Who lives in a place like this? I felt kind of foolish, but I laughed at the moment too. My parents own a construction company, so they have a lot of heavy machinery. James had taken a picture of them with his phone camera and put it up on social media. And his caption was also somehow as if he made fun of it. I got angry about it. And James said, It's not about mouthing. It's just that you're taking it in a distorted way. And then he said, I didn't think that a New York girl grew up in a countryside like that. And then he continued to take pictures of the countryside. I started to wonder if this was the right marriage. Later that day, I went to meet James' family. They snickered when they heard about my college and my parents' occupation. I can't help it. Outside work is for people who aren't good at studying. You must have the strongest luck to marry James even though you have no skills. Well, there is a saying that luck is part of the ability, but don't drag James down too much. That's what my mother-in-law said. I was stunned because I did not expect to be treated like that. I was getting more and more anxious about our marriage. But it's crazy to hesitate now. I don't have a job and I can definitely make a reasonable living with James. So I told myself that this was fine. We didn't have a wedding ceremony. The reason was that our families were totally different and I wanted to avoid having all of them in one location. Even when we met face to face once, I felt that his family somehow made fun of my parents, so I apologized to my parents. They are right, so it doesn't matter and I'm used to it because I often encounter such senses doing this job. I felt sorry for my father, who laughed and said that. I really respect my father for making this company so big even though he is the first generation. He never blames me for my inadequacies. If you have any problems, you can always come back to me. I would be very happy to have an office worker, and I'm happy to work with Sarah. He always welcomed me and respected my decisions, even if my future husband is rude. As long as you are happy, that's fine of course, so don't care what they say. But if he says anything to hurt you, I will get angry. That's all he said. I couldn't achieve anything, even though he looked such good care of me. I couldn't tell my parents that I had been drinking and attending parties and earning money by doing that. I vowed at that moment to live my life in a way that I could be proud of myself from now on. James and I then got registered and became husband and wife. Every day, I made James lunch, did the house chores, and waited for him to come home. I was a nobody, trying to be the best wife I could be for James. But James changed after we got married. James didn't like anything I did. He would say, That's why people with different backgrounds hear different values. He also took his work stress out of me more and more. And the hardest thing of all was that we couldn't have children. We wanted to have children as soon as we got married. But we couldn't have children as we had hoped. We went to the clinic to run some tests. But we couldn't find any problem. So we continued doing our best. Six months after we got married, we crawled over a trivial matter. I will never forget what James said to me at that time. I was so unlucky by getting a wife who can't have kids, can't work, and isn't productive. I can live without you without a problem. But then, you would get some support from the state, wouldn't you? You are a hundred years too young to talk big to me. That's what he said. This is definitely moral harassment. Whether I was angry or crying, James' rage echoed through the room. I still put up with the thought that I must be getting punished for my past behavior. Then, a good story came to me. 
My father told me that there was a nice property in my city. He said that a friend of his was going to be transferred, so he wanted to sell his house. When I told James about it, he wasn't too keen on the idea, but we agreed to go and have a look at it. The houses are close to James' office, and my father's friend is willing to sell it to me for half the market price. However, my father had already bought the house. If we don't move in, the house will be the second house of my parents. And he told me, I would be grateful if you would live in the house. A house deteriorates if someone doesn't live in it. You don't need to pay the rent, so why don't you move in? I know you will need money in the future, so I think it would be good to save it now. I soon suggested that to James. I've never lived in a dirty house, so I can only tell you after we had a look into it. And besides, I don't want to owe your parents. I thought, well, that's fine then. I would be more upset if even after moving in, he stays arrogant as he is. I decided to ask my father for the key number, and we took a look together. It is a newer and more stylish house than I had imagined. I was impressed by its luxurious appearance as well as its surroundings. James was also excited. After all, this is an upscale residential area. James, who has a lot of pride, was very satisfied with the location and the appearance of the house. When we went inside, we were not disappointed. The house is about twice the size of our current house. We were planning to move when we have kids, so it's a little early, but it's ideal. James got excited. Sarah, your dad did a great job. I was wondering what kind of house he was going to show us because he is so rustic, but it's much better than I thought it was going to be. He said, I want to live here. I agreed. But I wanted to pay my father a little rent. I felt too bad to let us live here for free. I told my father that. It's totally fine for you to live here for free. I mean, the house, in my opinion, is not very resistant to rain. I only bought it because I could afford it for the price of the land. So don't worry about it. But I think you should just rebuild the house eventually. He says it's free of charge. When I told James about it, he said, Your dad doesn't understand the value of money. That's great. I hate ignorant people, but it turns out to be a good thing. I've learned a lot from your father. I was angry at his attitude, but I've never won a quarrel against him. I know that in the end, I will be talked over in different terms and James gets what he wants. Eventually, I thanked my father and we moved in. However, living in a detached house can be a hassle. Community rules, garbage duties, and board members' event have added an unprecedented burden to my life. Since I'm a homemaker, I was the one who did the jobs and attended all the events. James seems busy, and I felt I had no choice. James was generally off on weekends. When we first got married, we would have lunch together at a fancy restaurant on our days off. But since about six months ago, he seems to be a different person. He started going to work on his days off more often and coming home late. He was never interested in fashion. But now, he is addicted to online shopping. He has his phone in his hands all day, and it's weird to see him grinning at the phone. I found it suspicious, but I didn't feel like asking him about that. It doesn't sadden me if James was cheating on me. However, if he did, I was going to make sure he was brought to justice accordingly. Then, just as I had expected, the incident happened. To my surprise, the adulterer stormed into my house. It was a Sunday morning. James was all on his phone that day. Normally, his phone never rang. 
But today, his phone rang. You're getting a call. Shouldn't you answer it? It's okay. It's a work call anyway. I've decided to not to answer the phone today because it's my day off. About an hour after the call, the intercom rang. I looked at the monitor and saw a woman I had never seen before. I asked, May I ask who you are? I'm James Coley. I'm having trouble reaching James. Is James there? She talked to me in a very unfriendly manner. My female intuition said that this woman is James' lover. James paled at the sound of adulterous voice echoing through the house. There was no doubt. I also got nervous. James hurried me out of the house and closed the front door so that I could not hear their conversation. But that audio is naive. I turned on the microphone on the intercom monitor. I can hear their conversation clearly. It's not right to come over to my house. You know my position. I don't reply to you because of this kind of rushed behavior of you. When he said that, the adulterous woman said, I've put up with it all this time too. Do you understand how I feel? Even if I get fired from the company, I'm fine as long as I can be with you, James. She's crying. I feel like I was watching some cheap late night drama series. The script seems so easily predictable that even I might be able to write. I thought they were going to hug each other and make up anyway, and that's exactly what happened. I was left with nothing but regret that I had wasted my time on something so uninteresting. I quickly turned off the monitor and pretended I didn't hear anything. When James came into the house, it was a sight to see what his excuse would be. About five minutes later, James returned as if nothing has happened. An employee who lives near here delivers the materials to me and shows me the envelope. I responded appropriately and decided to let him fool me for the day. The next day, I finished my chores and started my important work. When it comes to cheating investigations, you should go to the credit agency. But I didn't want to spend money on this nonsense. I started playing detective by myself. I slipped the GPS into James' cover, and I started watching him all the time. On the third day after I started it, there was an immediate movement. After work, he headed in a different direction from our house. I followed him. He went into the house of the woman he was having an affair with, and he didn't come out for about four hours. He told me he was working late, so I'm pretty sure he was having an affair. I caught the two of them on camera getting along. I also made sure to check James' messages on my computer, which tell he is going to be late. It was so easy to capture them together, which made me sincerely glad I didn't hire an agency. The material is so well done that it is hard to believe that I have been playing detective for a week. I was even about to start to think I have been a detective in a previous life. And that night, I questioned James. James, there is something you are keeping from me, isn't there? I think it's time to settle that story now. But he changed his face to a serious one, as if he could sense my determination. What's your point? What's wrong with you? You are living a stress-free life where you don't have to work. There is nothing more luxurious than that. I think you should turn a blind eye. He doesn't seem to feel sorry at all. I'm fully prepared for that. I don't have any feelings left for James. That's why I said it clearly. That's called moral harassment. I don't work outside the home, and I don't get paid, but I have taken care of you perfectly. So I can't forgive you, and I don't think I can be with you anymore. That said, James started to laugh. You've just saved me a lot of trouble. You're getting old, old. Just divorce me. You're not worthy to be fed by me. 
There is zero good in it for you. I knew he was probably saying something I should be upset about, but I'm not getting any of the content. I feel like I'm listening to music from some strange country. I laid out all the signs of infidelity I've ever collected on the table in front of him. James looks at it and sneakers. You really have nothing to do, don't you? Forget it. The time I spent talking to you is just a waste. So get your divorce papers or whatever you're going to do and get it over with. If you're really okay with that. I handed him the filled out divorce papers. Yeah, okay. Here you go. Divorce papers. I want it done by the end of the week, so write them down quickly. And this house is my father's, so you have to leave. As I said that, his expression stiffened and changed. Wait, I will take this house. I've told the company that I own this place, so it will be hard to take that back. I will buy it from you at a discount, so you get out. That's impossible. He dares to ask for the house after being taken care of by me and my father so much more. No, no, no. It's not a question of taking it or giving it away. A house is something that originally belonged to the owner. I don't know if you were trying to look good, but you can't do that, so you should give up. Tell the company that you lied to them. When I tell him, he got angry and explode. He was throwing things and breaking things, and I felt like he was going to kill me. I left the house and called my father. I told him everything, and he got angry. I went back to my parents' house and told James that I was divorcing him. James agreed to the divorce, and it was decided that we would file for divorce on Sunday. Then my father told me, It's a good opportunity. I've rented a stretch unit nearby, and we can move James' stuff out there. And we can let everything there that we don't need. So let's clean up and clear out. That's what he said. I didn't get his words, but I took my stuff out as my father instructed. James seems to come home from time to time to get his stuff, but he seems to be rolling into the woman's apartment. I had something I wanted to be done by Sunday. That is to inform the company of the affair. It's not a sweet world where there are no functions. The young woman also needs to be punished for her behavior. I sent the proof of the affair to the company. The next day, I received several calls from James. He must have received the proof of the affair. I'm just telling them what happened. I don't have time to talk to you. We don't need to understand each other anymore, so I won't even try. Let's file the divorce papers on time, and let's both be free. That's all I texted him. The divorce papers were filed on time. I consulted with the lawyer my father introduced me to about alimony and made sure they both paid it. And on this day, my father did the most refreshing thing. My father said he didn't want a house with that kind of seismic insecurity, so he demolished it. James, who didn't know that, was surprised when he came to pick up his stuff the next day. I just left the key to the rental storage in the small mailbox. The woman was left to pay the price for her infidelity. She had worked at the headquarters of a major bank, but was now working in a regional office. James couldn't even get transferred, so he became a copy boy. James, full of pride, left the company immediately. And even if he looked for another company, it was hard to find a job in this time of recession. The alimony he had paid me had wiped out his savings, and he was now living in poverty. He and his lover broke up immediately since then. I heard a rumor that he is now living in a shabby apartment and doing some part-time jobs. He made fun of other people for his entire life. Now it's his turn to be ridiculed, and he deserves it. As for me, I went back to my parents' house and started working as an office worker in the family business. 
The glitter of the city is nice, but I feel at home in the countryside. My friends live their own suitable lives, and I again realize how foolish I was in the past. From now on, I would like to improve myself by being surrounded by good air and kind people.